Hey everybody, thanks for coming to my talk. My name is Tony Ucida Velez. I go by Tony UV. I'm here to talk about attack trees or attack modeling for containers as a service. I wanted to um, just really emphasize that this talk is really more, it's kind of like a psychological attack centric talk. So as security practitioners, you might be concerned about, well, what attacks exist? What kind of measures can I put in? But really this is all about trying to be criminalistic against um, containers different types of containers that are out there. Um, there's there's all, also a prerequisite that you have a basic knowledge of different types of containers that, that exist out there today. Another thing that just as context for this topic is that the attack modeling that we discussed really is part of an overall threat modeling methodology. And uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote this um, threat modeling methodology called PROCESS, PROCESS for Attack Simulation and Threat Assessment. And it has seven stages. And really, the focus of this talk is solely going to be on understanding the attack surface for containers. Um, and so it will look at, you know, again, from just a criminalistic sense, not from a software security sense or a, uh, a, a software sense or a security-centric sense, because there are different ways to threat model your applications. Uh, this is going to be more driven from the perspective of true risk mitigation based upon viable threats and attacks that exist today and intents around compromising containers. So the, we have a quick, quick uh, brief outline. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, I'm, I'm a former debater, so I like the, there's this acronym in debate called sh the SHITS. And it stands for Significance, Harms, Inheritance, Topicality, and Solvency. We won't, we won't really talk too much about the solvency part because, again, this is really attacker-centric. And we're trying to just see how can we get into containers and to exploit them. So we're going to talk about the significance of containerization today. Uh, we'll talk about some background, which is always helpful to have some context. We'll look into some threat motives, and there will be a vignette or a scenario that we'll depict. Is there um, anybody from Uber here? No? OK, good. Um, <laughs> the, the reason I bring that up, and I just, you know, it's, it's difficult to really do an attack vignette or a play, a playbook on what an attack model would look like, just hypothetically, because it really doesn't have any context for the audience, which is you guys. So there is a um, attack vignette that is really geared around attacking um, containerized, web services that are running in, in the cloud um, uh, using uh, exposed APIs and containers. Um, and the reason I, I pulled from uh, Uber is because they've been pretty proficient in adopting you know, containers within their overall um, adoption model for applications and management. So that's the reason I say I'm not picking on Uber, uh, but I wanted to really exemplify really the causal factors around threats and what attack patterns really come into play when you, when you want to attack any organization that is looking to adopt uh, containers as a service. A little bit about myself, oops, just forgot that. I'm having to move two, two things at the same time here. So a little bit about myself, uh, a couple years ago I um, came up with this threat modeling methodology with a colleague of mine in the security field called Marco Morana. He's out of uh, London. And um, we basically developed this risk-centric threat modeling because the premise around this is really simple. Why spend time in mitigating if it, the things that you're trying to solve for mitigation really doesn't, it's not worth anything or it doesn't have viable threat patterns? So the, the whole po point with the PASTA framework is that you basically establish credibility and threat assertions. What threats exist today so that you could actually build a, an attack tree um, that's viable and credible? So you have to harvest things like threat intel, threat data, but the point is, protect the things that matter, protect the things that are likely to happen. And uh, you know, other types of mantras or uh, threat modeling objectives that exist that are security and software centric do a great job in their goals and objectives, however, it's a little bit different in the sense that they're mostly doing it for the sake of security, for the sake of a, a better software architecture or software deployment. Um, contact information is there, is there as well. Um, I run the OWASP chapter in Atlanta, and I'm the CEO for a security consulting firm called Firstright. 
So containers have been proliferating for a good while. So it's important that this is now becoming um, more and more uh, related to adoption in different types of application models. And the significance of containerization is, is really important because it provides a huge opportunity for um, obviously decoupling traditional monolithic applications into uh, more um, individualistic uh, application services. So truly when you go back to service-oriented architecture, we now have the ability to have unique applications and services reside within its own uh, entity and thereby protecting each entity uh, possibly with different rule sets in truly applying a security onion to each container. There's been a huge adoption. Like many things that are cloud related, a lot of things that, um, you know, in terms of virtualization or cloud, you know, um, is the driver is cost, it's cost efficiency. It's not necessarily, and it's also about scalability. So the proliferation of all these different you know, here's kind of a timeline. Containers is really an old term that was implemented with, you know, um, Unix-related technologies a long, long time ago. So containerization has existed for a good while. It, it, how many of you guys, you know, are familiar with like Linux containers or Solaris namespaces? Okay, so a good, a good bunch of you. So that's good. So you have a notion that this is nothing new. Um, what is new is the fact that we're taking this up to the application level. So as we have different applications running Nginx and Redis and Memcast servers, and you think of an application environment to be very monolithic and just you know, only be coupled by the infrastructure that it resides on, like virtual servers or um, physical bare metal servers. Now we have the ability to have these application virtualization components, so that's, that's great. It's great for, you know, from the functional sense that we can now spin up and spin down any one of these services. So from a functional standpoint, that's very important. Now, why am I talking about this when it relates to attacks? Because one of the common themes that you'll hear me say during this talk is about when you're, how many people here know of someone that's been federally indicted for um, a felony crime? Anybody? Okay. And the reason I, I ask that is because if you're somewhat familiar with them, you, you have a notion of kind of like the criminology component or psychological component of premeditation. And if, you're, if you follow along some of the major beaches, they're the people that attack or the organized, organized groups that do attack. They have to understand workflow. They have to understand causal factors for adoption of technology. They have to understand what is the footprint of that technology, how it's managed, how it's orchestrated, how it's instrumented. All of these things are very important if you want to be able to attack it. Now, software centric and security centric will just look at these components, we'll look at the kernel, we'll look at the host system, we'll look at file systems and, and UID levels and stuff like that, and that's great, but it's, it's short sighted to what criminal intents really, really, um, really call for. So, the overall landscape around containerization is really changing. You have you know, just here's just a subset of labels that really reflect on technology groups that are out there to be able to manage containers, you know, locally as part of your DevOps process. Um, orchestrate, you know, a bed or, or a sea of containers, you know, using Docker Swarm or Kubernetes or, or other types of uh, solutions that are out there. CoreOS, Rocket, OpenStack, Magnum. There's a lot that the, there's going to be more. There's going to be more solutions out there to manage these containers and repos and to be able to, um, to, to manage the configuration. Again, why is this relevant? Because these are the technologies that if you want to understand how to be able to inject your malicious malware into repositories or you want to be able to understand the workflows that are, that are um, inherently flawed. As an attacker, you have to be able to understand the A to B to C in terms of um, in, image sharing, uh, in terms of creating a Docker file, in terms of you know what does the new system development lifecycle look like for these types of uh, services. Okay, Pro proliferation significance, future attack implications. So uh, non-tech implications, and this is we'll talk a lot about this today. DevOps team members, uh, network security groups. Uh, open source marketplaces and, and repositories, technology implications that um, have actually happened to some degree 
container breakout via kernel exploits, misconfiguration opportunities, privilege escalation via root, and illicit access control requests. The, at the bottom here, you see speed of deployment and dependency check freedom. The openness of, again, the movement in which, I, I, there's a figure out there for those that saw some of the, the videos from DockerCon. I don't know, have you guys checked out a lot of the, the videos from DockerCon? The adoption rate on containers is like 18,000. It, it's by far the number one technology being adopted right now albeit in the DevOps field. So it's, it's, it's largely being tinkered with, and although there's some organizations that are using this full-fledged for production. But the, the important thing here is, is that the speed in which you know, these technologies are, are, um, are able to contain all these different flavors of web services, uh, RESTful APIs, um, and the, the culture of information sharing provides a ripe opportunity for attacks. And we'll talk about that. Um, during this talk. So, now, so what does this mean in terms of the threat agents? As we especially look at huge implementations of containerized um, services where there's orchestration needed, um, you know, th there's, there's going to be a heavy shift to really doing some open source intelligence gathering in order to target DevOps. So you want to be able to understand how your target, if you're, if you, and this is again speaking towards as if all of you have criminal intent for attacking an organization. Now take this, take this as advice, you know, take this as guidance in terms of how you could look in, into your own adoption of containers so that you can try to mitigate some of these attack patterns that we'll talk about today. But the focus of DevOps really redefines, and you'll see that the easiest way to inject any sort of malicious activity or attack that uh, attack pattern into um, a, a DevOps uh, lifecycle is going to be through uh, uh, targeted social engineering. You want to be able to understand the technology footprint, which we've touched upon a little bit in terms of what solutions are out there, what may, um, what uh, companies are out there really pushing ahead and forging ahead with orchestration software and stuff like that. We want, we want to be able to understand workflows and architecture. The end of generic attack patterns is, is here. So with, with now greater layers of getting access to um, different exposed APIs, and now with the opportunity for containers to provide uh, deprecated privileges, deprecated use cases within those, within those um, containerized applications, you have the, really the opportunity for security to, be, to do unit testing for each container. Now, Currently today, that's not happening. Um, currently today, a lot of DevOps groups are really, literally running around with their heads chopped off, uh, just simply trying to um, get acclimated with how to use, uh, you know, Docker or um, uh, Rocket or any of these other technologies. Targeted attacks are definitely going to be on the rise, and a lot of the already existing exploits that have happened in there in terms of remote code execution or privilege escalation patterns have been extremely uh, niche. Uh, orchestration will also play a key, and we'll look at that with some, with some uh, illustrations here shortly. Okay, so thinking beyond AppSec attack factors, hacking process, this is, this is basically actually something that was pulled from uh, Uber Post somewhere, I think it was part of their Uber uh, public repo that they have on Docker, Docker Hub. And the whole intent here is that there is, because this is DevOps really embodies a, a culture of sharing, of sharing uh, images, of sharing technology, of sharing lessons learned, there is a huge um, opportunity to learn about what are the tools and what are the workflows that organizations are using in order to manage their containers. So some inherited threat models that we'll look at is that First of all, you know, so I spoke in Shanghai um, a couple of years ago at Cloud Connect. There's this cloud conference there. And one of the things that I talked about there was the fact that mismanagement of cloud components. And that's going to be ongoing. Um, if you've dealt with Office 365, if you even dealt, you know, it, even from a, a, a commercial sense, if you dealt with other cloud-related services that are out there, you can recognize the opportunity for misconfiguration, cloud operations mismanagement. And that's to the advantage of the attacker. Uh, misconfiguration. There's a lot of 
there's, there's a huge dependency on the Docker file in terms of what it basically brings to be able to compile a binary image that's going to be basically your, 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 your Docker uh, image. So the notion that you can taint something uh, as it relates to the Docker file with arbitrary, um, with, with, uh, with calls, wget calls or code calls to repositories or to get binaries that are really foreign to what you need that container to do provides an opportunity for the threat agent in order to, um, to, to be able to uh, get down some binaries into that container and have that polish and, and be part of a swarm of, of containers that are managed. Tenant hopping is nothing new. It's, it was actually concerned around uh, with VMware and hypervisor and other types of OS level virtualization. So it's the same concern here that you want to be able to have that isolation between one container and the next. Um, and then broken trust models. So the idea here, for those of you that are familiar with containers, is that each container, so basically what you're doing is you're wrapping an application service into its own individual uh, entity. It has its own IP. It has its own actor that's running that application service. It has application level, um, it has a namespace that it pertains to. It has control groups that it, it, it pertains to. So it's definitely decoupled from, from your traditional um, you know, monolithic application. But what is inherent in terms of a threat model is, is that you have these uh, trust models that fail. There's a lot of implicit trust. And that's nothing new really when it comes to security. OK, so now we're going to shift our you know, attention to threat motives and attack vignettes. And we're kind of foreshadowing some abuse cases in DevOps here. And what we want to look at is look at in, in, you know, take, taking a page from a risk-centric threat modeling. In order to, stage two of the PASTA methodologies talks about enumerating your use cases or your technology that you're using. Just like a criminal would, you know, if you're trying to do a simple B and E, breaking an entry into, I don't know, a downtown LA building. One of the first things you do is just simply understand who's going into the building, what are they doing, how are they doing it, and how are they getting in. So you want to be able to understand basic things in terms of use cases and components. And as an attacker, you want to do the same thing for your containers. So you want to be able to understand how is decoupling being, being done. Now, oftentimes, that is enforced via the configuration of the container uh, Docker file manifest. And you could actually you know, uncouple uh, some uh, uh, some containers by having some misconfiguration, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But th the opportunity for abuse is for you to really abuse the trust boundaries between one container and the next. Process uh, isolation. Um, process isolation is difficult when you have the same actor or process uh, doing it. So just to kind of create a metaphor, if just this gentleman is in charge of um, making, uh, uh, making, let's say we could basically uh, personify him as a process in a container. And so he's running, uh, you know, he's running as a process in a container, but he's doing a lot of different actions, create actions, he's doing a lot of read actions, he's, he's, he's doing, he's building um, uh, images, he's running, you know, images, he's killing in processes. If he's, do if the same actor is doing a lot of different actions within your container, then there is really no decoupling of processes. And so that is an inherent risk. So um, what we're trying to exemplify here is that there's use cases that exist within your application container that can be looked upon to see what abuse cases can we do, if anything. Dependency. So there's an inherent dependency with the host resource. Um, and it's long been known that, you know, Containers run with elevator privileges with UID zero, which means root. And you know, just recently, um, there with Docker, they just announced like a couple of months ago or weeks ago that uh, version one ten or something like that is going to have uh, user groups. So you can now, instead of running everything as root, you can actually have now more um, user defined roles for different types of actions in your containers. But that is all at the mercy of the DevOps person who is actually, you know, developing this um, and, and, and really um, instr instrumenting the containers. 
web enabled APIs, you know, the, the benefit here is, is that there's a lot of them, all right? And so as with any API, it inherently provides an opportunity for fuzzing attacks, arbitrary commands to be um, introduced um, as part of uh, parameters that an API might be expecting. And so you can fuzz those parameters to see what the API abends with in terms of a response. And one of my favorites, because this is really the way I would go about it if I was a uh, pay for criminal, uh, would be to really taint the containers into public repos. And there's private repos, there's public repos, and um, I actually got, I don't wanna, I kinda wanna play a little uh, media clip that I don't know if it'll even play, but it's, it's really interesting to see what is the status quo guidance around DevOps people that are out there that are playing with, with orchestration technologies or container-based uh, technologies, and what is their guidance for adoption, use, and implementation? All right, so targeting um, container components. Um, so we, a lot of this will run around the same things that we just covered. So Docker run namespace. Um, the Docker daemon, again, uh, runs in elevated privileges, and as you see here, you have, why isn't this showing? It's weird. Okay, that's, anyway, there's a discrepancy here. There, there's some um, other images here. It basically just shows the stack, and the Docker containers rely on Docker images uh, that you can get from public or private repos, and there's a Docker registry that maintain, maintains all of those images. And so the, the target components, when you're doing threat modeling, for example, you want to be able to identify what components do you want to test for viable threat patterns. Number one is the namespace. What is the namespace in which your container is running? Number two, the Docker daemon. Uh, are you able to define unique uh, UIDs for your applications within unique containers? Number three, what is the exposure level of your APIs internally to malicious possible actors or malware, or malware. No one thinks about the malware, and um, you know, if you look at the, the biggest threat for mobile devices right now, it is mo uh, mobile malware, and it's because it's a lot easier to basically package in um, exploited means via uh, polymorphic malware than it is uh, for a human to infiltrate you know, um, access to what, how these containers are, are run and operated. Uh, the Docker file is really the kind of the blueprint for which your images are, uh, are being constructed. So to be able to contaminate that with illicit commands or configuration to the benefit of the attacker is going to be, you know, uh, a good uh, threat motive. Infiltrate Docker Hub or Registry. Multiple options exist given uh, numerous functions with a tainted image. And that just simply says that with a tainted image you have the ability to um, even have uh, malware uploaded uh, and associated with a vulnerability or exposing a vulnerability within, within a container image. So I have invented the new term. I wouldn't be really a security professional if I didn't. So, um, and, and I'm just kind of making fun of myself. So I'm, please don't take me seriously. I really don't, don't really care. You have to have a quote from Art of War too. What's that? You have to have a quote from Art of War too. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I was thinking about, you know, so when you're really kind of social engineering a, a repository for which you know there's a high prevalence of pulling, you know, existing containers um, from a repo, you know, I, I was trying to find a, 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 it's really not, you know, fishy, it's definitely having counterfeit images within a repository. Um, and that is a, you know, I'm really kind of focusing on this because I see that, it, there, in fact, there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's been a Black Hat um, presentation that was done specifically on the opportunity of having tainted images within a repository. But the idea is this, is that you serve deliberately tainted images to a marketplace knowing that you're just casting a line out there, hoping these DevOps, you know, functionally minded engineers are going to go there and consume your image so they can deploy it within their environments. The goal is mass deployment and consumption of images with vulnerabilities or backdoor. That would be phenomenal. Con convenience of pre-built images is too tempting. So, you know, when you're starting out and, and as an engineer, and you maybe are not really too strong in container management or Docker or some of these other technologies that are out there, you're like, sure, I want a head start. And it's, so from a human aspect, it makes complete sense. Um, like most insecurity initiatives, weak or immature processes around open source security testing, that, that doesn't happen today. I mean, 
we consult with a lot of major organizations and there is just recently, I would say within the past two years, a push to, to test open libraries. You know, everyone's testing their code that they, they, they develop, but no one's really testing what they're inheriting from open source compiled libraries. I think that, that's recently just starting as an initiative over the past two, two and a half years. So as attackers, which we all are, we're going to profit from this and, and try to exploit it. So um, weaknesses that are have, have been historically associated with containers have been the absence of user spaces, um, you know, and, and, and also being able to not being able to add adding users to Docker roots which inherent root privileges. Now that's recently changed, but that uh, with Docker at least, because they're now providing the ability to have more security in user groups. But again, the the, you know, this is a new security mitigation that's coming out right now in terms of having user groups in Docker. So by the time that this gets fully implemented and used at a wide scale level, I mean, it's going to be you know, years. So from an attacker standpoint, we have the ability to profit from this gap. Um, other misconfigura misconfiguration gaps, which is commonplace. So this is actually, I'm going to give, well, I, I did give credit to the, the guy, Anthony Bellatini, he's an Italian guy. Um, he did a uh, black hat talk, and, a, and he this is really stuff that he pulled out. He had his stats. It's really interesting, just to kind of substantiate this whole dishing, you know, type of notion. Um, so if you look at Docker Hub, you look at how much pre-built containers exist, and then you look at and this has actually an audio file that goes with it, um, but I, that I wanted to play because what I found was this is great, you know, advice from this um, DevOps guy. He's got a lot of you know uh, experience functionally with with uh, creating managing containers. He was like, Docker Hub's where it's at. If you just want to get started, you want to throw up a memcast server, you want to have a you know uh, ASP.NET server or whatever. Um, you, there's containers for everybody. Redis, great. You want it, pull it down, use it, head start. So there's a, this is common evangelization that's happening from a functional sense, and as a criminal. We want to be able to say, hey, this is great stuff because it falls right into the opportunity of providing tainted images, and they, they don't have to be overtly tainted. You know, they they can be just conspicuously just you know uh, idle calls that you know that could even be having some you know um, <laughs> having some some comments that are misleading. You know, with it within you know Docker files or different manifests within the image, so within the image repo. But look at these stats here: one hundred percent official images. Out of 15,000, um, 90% of official images have vulnerabilities and no security inspection today by Docker. This kind of reminds me a lot of, um, and I hate to make that another mobile reference, but when I, I first started out with the smartphones, it was, it was the Android, the, the one with the, the QWERTY keyboard we pushed out, the, the first Droid. And that was by far my favorite phone, and we don't really use Android anymore, it's just because of the marketplace. And I think the marketplace is when you talk about SaaS related solutions or whatnot are really going to undermine the um, the technologies because you know the the the, the, the companies like Docker com Kubernetes does a better job because they have more layers and we'll go into some attack trees that'll show that but um, I really think that as a viable attack pattern it serves as a great attack vector. Okay. So precedence of attack patterns. Um, so we talked about the precedence of some con container weaknesses. We want to match those with some attack patterns. And th these have actually happened. So th there have been vulnerable I images across the marketplace. Multiple attack vectors, included tainted images, have had malware references in them. And or deliberately reference um, components, application components, that have, been, have had known vulnerabilities, even Heartbleed, even Heartbleed. Kernel-based exploits, um, Docker container breakup proof of concept, has been well documented. Basically, it relies on legacy Linux uh, containers code found to be vulnerable. That's since been patched. But the point out the the point here is that that exploit follows an attack pattern that benefits the attacker. The attacker wants to break out of the container to go to other containers that maybe are handling PII that are maybe handling more important processes. So that attack pattern, as to support a threat pattern that's viable and realistic, makes complete sense. Men in the middle for Docker Hub access. HTTP access by default for Docker Hub access. You have to configure it with SSL. And most, as we know, when you're configuring SSL and you're a functional engineer, you're doing it wrong or you're doing self-signed certs. Um, so it provides a huge opportunity for attack patterns to do man in the middle. 
Okay, so the attack surface for containers is, so you have really kind of four major areas. You have the applications in which that run within the container. So again, you have your Nginx, you have your MySQL, you have your PostgreSQL, whatever you want to do. And, and typically, this, again, I want to stress, I was actually talking to Jim Manico about this uh, outside, that I think, if done well, containers can undermine our, our um, the security industries, uh, at least from a consulting standpoint, because if everything is done right, you can really apply security to containers in a way that really reduces, um, it provides a lot of defense in depth, truly. But unfortunately, the state of where we're at right now is that um, you know the, the just the mass, the newness of DevOps um, is 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 being done so kind of haphazardly, so it provides opportunities for attackers to really exploit that. So you have the application itself that's running in a container. You have uh, it's leveraging system services that are basically supporting the container for let's say admin use cases, like I want to SSH to my container because it has its own individual IP. Um, it can, it prefers root, uh, point that out. Um, the, there's those low level processes that are running within that same container that basically handle like the, ne the network interface card and the networking and the file system and stuff like that. And then you have the kernel level. So when you're thinking about attacks, attacking the containers that you're instantiating within your own environment, you want to be able to think, okay, what can I do? So from, from a security or software centric sense, you want to hit your APIs here. You want to do fuzzing. You want to do parameter alteration. So whatever parameters you're expecting in an API, you want to fuzz that, do that, and continue to do that. We're doing that today, no different here. At this level, you want to be able to see, this is really about hardening the configura configuration between the low-level system processes and the high-level system processes. And then at the kernel level, there's some mitigation countermeasures that I'll actually uh, talk about at the very end. Okay. So I'm not going to go into, and I'm just going to, let's see if there's some, yeah, there's some animation here, which I thought, any, any time you do animation, you always think it's a good idea when you're doing it, but, um, you know, during the presentation, you always regret it. But the point here is, is that, you know, you have, it, again, from a criminal sense, you have, th this is really a well-defined blueprint of fully developed, fully implemented containers being orchestrated you know, for wide deployment and consumption and management. And it really shows all the different layers of technology in terms of Linux, of Docker for container management, of Kubernetes for pods and namespace management that encompasses these containers. Um, you have DevOps roles, you have Zookeeper, which is basically the, the, the area which is gonna be responsible for configuration management uh, of your overall uh, container images. And so, what I, what I basically noted in, in, these, in these animation is that you have, from an attack standpoint, you have the Docker file, the individuals managing you know, the configuration of that, the Docker hub and repo, all of etcd, all of the etcd uh, repos, just simply because of what's in these, um, the privileges in Kubernetes that is awarded to the etc daemon in terms of what it manages and what it has access to, namely secrets, the secrets files. Um, is is very important. So, you know, if, if if we were looking again just from where to attack, it's and you look at it, you you might think, well, I want to attack the container. Well, well, good luck. You know, I mean, if you're if you're really going to be a criminal, I mean, <clears throat> it's easier. How it's easier. The only way you're going to get to the container is from exposed APIs or from uh, uh, really doing the Trojan horse through images. And so exposed APIs, you could also you know, rely on client-side uh, vulnerabilities and like Docker clients, um, you know, trying to attack the clients that are being used at different organizations as an attack within a larger attack tree. But it's so much easier just to simply you know, implement um, uh, a Trojan horse through a, a Docker repo. All right, so again, no Uber people here, right? So um, I called this actually a personal services attack vignette instead of uh, blatantly calling it out. But so this is just kind of a, a case study that I, I drew up. And so bear with me as I cover, I kind of speed through the PASTA methodology. But number one is criminals 
what are some objectives that we, we kind of foresee Uber that, that they want? Well, they want to grow their segments. They have flat car service now, they have Uber pool, now they're, now they're into trucking, I heard. They're into trucking. I don't know if you guys read some of the news, but this is really interesting, you know, opportunities there. So, you know, so uh, as any sort of like service, like I just took Uber over here actually. So if Uber is down, I'll be pissed. You know, I might use Lyft or something like that. So reliability, continuity is, is a big objective for them. Credibility amongst riders and drivers, definitely. You know, they want to sustain that. Otherwise, their services really can't be sustained and their credibility can be tarnished. And cross-selling opportunities will provide more revenue growth. So why do we want, why are we talking about this in an attack-centric talk? It's because as criminals, we want to be able to understand what causes them pain. So objective, you take the inverse in, in order to be able to, to, to take an adverse strategy to be able to say, this is where I want to focus. And then if you're on the flip side, if you do work at Uber, and you want to be able to have a risk-centric approach, then you align the technology and components that support those objectives, presuming that those are correct. So, and then you see it, what, what other sort of regulatory things and drivers that actually might, um, might actually, they might be obligated to, to support like data privacy laws, state, federal, EU, etc. Now, moving on, now we understand an objective, what is the technology footprint? And we, uh, specifically for Uber. So we want to be able to attack that. So we want to focus on, you know, um, we want to map business objectives to targets. So how does segment growth and availability and credibility and cross-selling opportunities really map to a target? So there's a lot of different components in the technology of containers that, especially the orchestration of containers, that can provide a DDoS-related uh, exploit. So we want to be able to begin to talk about you know, threat patterns and our attack trees that follow are going to exemplify that. Did I switch? Oh, I didn't. I'm sorry. I'm looking at two different slides here. Um, so Uber, Uber has provided, this is just from some basic black box OSINT stuff, is that Uber's provided an SDK. That could be, uh, and that's, that's an SDK that is pseudo, it's kind of in a public repo uh, on Docker, on Docker Hub. So to be able to uh, infiltrate that and, and to be able to contribute to that SDK so that it gets further uh, shared amongst developers um, is, a, is a great way to, again, have a Trojan horse within something that they're providing already within their Docker repo. APIs, exposed APIs, uh, service-oriented architecture, backend services. Th this is what Uber has said that they're using. They're using Node.js for many services. Python, Tornado, uh, Golang, and Java, backend data stores, React and Postgres for data stores, and Redis for caching. Uh, Ringpop provides a highly available, consistent hash link for app layer sharding of services. So this is all with a simple intel so that you can basically say, I know they're using containers. Now I know what their apps, app containers might be like. And we'll, um, I'll show an example of, of, of that in the next slide. Now, uh, open source intelligence, you know, can easily identify some of their blueprint with the, have you guys ever built, been to Built With? It's a great site for OSINT. Um, so being able to look at their exposed APIs to enumerate version and technology and so forth. And then obviously looking at job boards to see what they're hiring for, which obviously is in support of their technology. So here we have an application decomposition, which is really a stage three in the risk-centric threat modeling. And what we're trying to say here is that, well, if I want to attack this, this entity of Uber and their container adoption strategy, I want to be able to, they, I know they have a public and private uh, directory and Docker Hub. I know that they have an AWS uh, 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 infrastructure that they actually might have their own trusted registry running there, which this is all the container. So, the idea here is, is that all the technologies that I kind of listed through the OSINT stuff, which is stuff that they've disclosed, is basically you could presume, because that's how containers work, you want to be able to decouple all these applications into their own application service so that you can manage them better, configure them better, um, interact with them one another, with another better. And so you have your DevOps team and you have certain different things that are key that you might want to look at as an attacker, like you know the config.json, which basically maintains your cred uh, credentials in interacting with all these different repositories. Um, 
So you know, there's 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 these different use cases, and there's multiple use cases in terms of the building, in terms of running, in terms of destroying, deleting different images. But the um, it, the other thing too that was uh, identified is that they're also using an LDAP component and uh, the Docker CA, uh, which is interesting. You know, so they might have integrated authentication there for uh, LDAP in across their their containers. So they might be, be doing something good there in order to basically validate uh, requests from one container to the next. Um, so now going much, much deeper, um, so we looked at, the other one was a high level diagram in terms of the, kind of more of a workflow. This is you know, looking at uh, use cases specifically around Docker. Unreal, this is kind of just a generic, and this was really provided by Anthony Bettini in part of his Black Hack talk, is again, going through like a decomposition of different actions that take place as part of like a data flow diagram, or uh, really this is just kind of like a um, system level call flow in terms of um, what different uh, commands in Docker yield in terms of actions on um, on the system. So you know, Docker create and start can start an image, um, and Docker um, kill and Docker stop. All the things that are in bold are things that, as an attacker, you want to be able to say, well, how do these act? How do these use cases help support an abuse case that I might be thinking as part of a threat pattern? Okay, so we've decomposed the, uh, you know, uh, going to stage three, we want to be able to have a black box, white box approach, but we want to be able to expose discoverable containers, do social engineering, get them sent. White box approach might be to identify actors on Docker clients, identify shared container nodes. Um, Linus is something to help audit your container image, is a tool um, that's an open source tool that help audit your, your container images. And obviously, if we're looking at uh, exposures in um, services and ports, you can use NMAP, but there's other things like NGREP or, um, that you could use to basically capture what are the call flows between one container and the next. So we've, um, looking at the kind of like the threat prognosis for, against containers, we want to be able to see what, what sort of um, uh, existing intel exists out there for personalized service attacks. And, these are actual articles that have come out with, I don't know if you guys heard about this, this was interesting, where the Lyft, one of the VPs or executives was actually uh, found to be sourced as the origination IP for uh, an actual hack that happened against Uber, where driver data was compromised. So if you're really looking to recruit and pull Uber driver data um, and, and get Lyft to build upon their market share, which they might be lagging behind, um, what better way in order to basically recruit a pool of drivers in order to basically support your service. So this is a viable threat pattern from a corporate espionage you know, type of example. I'm not implicating anything about the, um, the, the uh, Lyft exec, but th this is some other viable threat patterns that you want to look at is IP theft, corporate sabotage, PII compromise, transaction fraud, or hacktivism if the company is pertaining to some sort of like social messaging that's disagreed upon. Now, some threat assertions that we can make from this is that, and we're going to go into our attack trees here, is that um, number one, we want to steal drivers. We want um, the attacker needs drivers' contact information um, in order to be able to recruit them and maybe socialize them in order to flip. I want to, uh, we want to be able to know, you know, contract terms uh, with Uber, so that that may or may not be really related to information that's managed within. Uh, containers unless there is a, a database that actually has you know contractual terms and stuff like that. Uh, a, a third threat assertion would want to be uh, I want T1, T2 but want to frame a target or competitor. Um, so you, you know maybe in that the actual attack that happened against Uber was actually a frame uh, because it would be playful to basically it would be kind of foolish if you're going to attack somebody to basically have the source IP address literally be tied to the a VP of infrastructure at Lyft. Uh, so threat agents, competition, um, competitive threat actors, bounty hunters, hackers for hire, or uh, foreign nation state actors. Okay, so let's talk about some, we, there's some threats that really need to be supported by weaknesses here. And the weaknesses in orchestration are the following, is that Containers run as root, and there's a low namespace space adoption in Docker. 
And up until recently, up until the new version, there's no user, um, there's no user uh, namespace. There's no really no user control in terms of assigning different users for your uh, for your Docker container. Um, containers are oftentimes shared uh, with root, and there's insecure transport layers that are associated with this. Um, challenges with client daemons and Docker are that there's there's actually exploits against the client itself that could provide an attack vector for an attacker to be able to attack the client, so that the, the DevOps person and uh, misconfiguration. Now, on container insecurity, the you can actually uncontainerize your container by having your Docker file basically have this configuration where you temporarily um, set the um, the actual container itself to be that of the host. So you're breaking out of your container and you're able to basically see other containers and that obviously defeats the whole purpose for containerization. So this is an example of misconfiguration and this is something that Docker has advisories and write-ups for. Um, there is a, a Chirut for archive extraction exploit that we'll uh, show in a second and a privilege escalation remote code execution so all of these container insecurity uh, things have been demonstrated and have been resolved and have been assigned their their um, their CVEs. But here is here's one, and this is uh, was shown in Black Hat. Um, this is the Bash and Docker container. Um, it was discovered to be present in 50% of some of the most popular uh, containers that were managed by Docker Hub. And um, basically, this this provided. Uh, uh, a denial of service capability uh, for uh, remote code execution for arbitrary commands to be passed um, you know, you, you know, via this uh, this, this uh, exploit. Um, so the the idea here is that the x.cgi was um, was basically passed an arbitrary command that was basically ingested uh, by the container and that basically uh, allowed for arbitrary command. Uh, code to be run locally on that container. Now this this might be mitigated in, in more largely uh, um, like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm implementations where they notice that there's a problem with the container and they can just kill that container and then just go back to a gold image and just simply reinstantiate it. But another one that was uh, found was really related to Elasticsearch. Uh, there was a, uh, th this was in 2014. Um, basically, this one provided a uh, breakout, container breakout. So with the threat motive of trying to break out from one container to the next, if you're using the Elasticsearch uh, image or in the in, in, uh, in Elasticsearch version in your container, you could basically use this exploit to break out and go to another container. And there's actually a payload checked into to Metasploit on that. So some simple attack trees that we'll look at, we only have three, is to basically understand, you know, um, map here threat motives to actual attacks. And it begins by, you know, we'll, we'll look at, you know, threat motive of uh, consumer confidence. So let's say we have an attack, a threat motive of creating a downtime. And so some of the, one of those DDoS related vulnerabilities or exploits is what we would want to focus on, but we would have to have a notion and understanding that our attack has to actually affect all of the containers that um, that could be you know, called in to replace the vulnerable container that we've attacked. But you know, for going back to the Uber example, let's say I want to create downtime in order to create you know a competitive edge or a bad uh, consumer confidence in a service, then you would you could focus uh, your on the Docker engine. Um, or there might be a weakness of bad container management in the sense that they pull from a public Docker repo that has um, basically is running as an, um, an untrusted container, it's running an untrusted container app that's running as root. So you pull a, re a, a container uh, image from the repo and that uh, container image is now running as root and you don't you know, run it under uh, deprecated user roles. Um, there is a vulnerable Docker engine, uh, a vulnerability that is that we just uh, showed, and we do the container breakout exploitation, which allows us to do different things like, you know, access the hosts, um, remove, uh, kill that actual container that's supporting that particular process, 
Um, and if we can basically weaponize this into something that affects other containers that might um, be spawned to to uh, remediate this attack, then uh, that would be that would be a good example of weaponization. This one is um, an alternate attack path, um, and it kind of shows as attack tree should multiple different ways to get to your your end result. So this threat motive is around. I want to steal drivers. Um, let's say I'm starting up an Uber, you know, service in China, or um, and I don't want to have to do all the business at work. And so of getting drivers and marketing and all that stuff, it's much more easier. In fact, I don't know if you saw the last 60 minutes, like two weeks ago, um, they did a great job of talking about you know uh, Chinese sanction attacks for compromising intellectual property, and that can mean anything. That can mean list of you know in this case drivers in order to, to get them to to flip um, but it could mean it can really mean anything but it really substantiates this idea that you want to be able to instead of building a business up with the data that you need and all these other things that you steal it and so this this provides an alternate attack path um, and I only have a couple minutes left right I have three minutes left um, so I want to be mindful of how, what, what slides I hit um, you, you'll notice here that I have, you know, one of the things I wanted to point out here is that you have this nice DevOps person, um, and the really, you know, the DevOps and, and the open source community is all about function and sharing and knowledge sharing, and as an attacker, you want to be able to exploit that. You want to be able to manipulate the fact that there's openness and sharing, and you want to be able to, uh, I'm not condoning this, by the way, I'm just saying, you know, this is a viable attack pattern, uh, that you want to be able to, you know, um, go to the repositories that they trust, and they're using and to be able to taint them with illicit actions, commands, and configurations. Um, if you look at the evil DevOps uh, icon there, that, that attack vector is that you could also, there's going to be an increase in um, OSINT or um, targeting these DevOps people to either turn them or to do what, I, you know, the, the dishing aspect that I presented earlier. I can't really go through, you know, all of the attack trees as I had planned, but um, this is an orchestration attack, which really focuses more on Kubernetes. And you know, with Kubernetes, you know, for those that are familiar with it, it provides even additional layers uh, in terms of overall management and orchestration, because really, containers become part of a pod, which are part of a namespace. So there's all these different levels of abstraction layer to provide levels of security and tightening. But still, nonetheless, there's opportunities in which you follow a threat motive of like, you want to gain illicit access to Kubernetes pods. They do have known weaknesses and misconfiguration that has been recognized by Google um, in terms where, for example, this, the secrets file that I mentioned earlier. The secrets file is actually accessible in Etsy by multiple containers that are run, um, that, that are basically running in different pods. And that's just a flaw in design. So in order to, you know, if I want to be able to get the secrets file in order to gain access to different containers and, and again, um, affect, you know, what's in those containerized environments, then that's a plausible attack pattern. This next couple of slides, I'm just going to kind of go through, it really just tells the story of the human element um, and easiest way to manipulate, um, you know, containers and, and, um, and get to that DevOps scenario. So just going through, you know, the, the Docker file um, manifest that I talked about earlier, this really provides a blueprint for security. So where do most people, when they're looking to, 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 to get this, um, to build their own containers, where do they start from? Again, they go to the repo. And what I did, you know, here is just, you know, look to see who's currently working in DevOps at, at Uber. And, you know, it was really easy to get kind of, and I validated this through cross-checking on different other social media sites, but, the, the ground of the matter is, is that there is a, because of this, again, this culture of sh information sharing and uh, where you're, you're trying to build um, containerized solutions, but you really don't know how and you want to do some lessons learned, there is a lot of people that are out there that are um, part of, they're, they're associated with a company name and they're out, the, out there sharing, you know, code or images or, you know, they're open to, to being interfaced with. It provides a ripe environment for which if you want to infiltrate some of these organizations, that definitely that would be a, a key attack pattern. I'm going to skip to some of the, uh, the two last slides here. There's a, a type library genre that I've kind of created here for containers. And basically this provides a quick checklist for 
what to look out for when you're wanting to really to try to defend against attack patterns that have existed, have taken place, and are completely viable based upon threats that have actually happened. So this is not fear monitoring, this is past tense, been, you know, this has actually happened. And in support of mitigation, there's a countermeasures library slide that I developed, which is basically what can you do to basically enforce greater security configuration, um, uh, what tools can you use that are native to some of the OSs and images that you have that are being leveraged as part of each container, and um, also, you know, what types of activities can you do in order to train your DevOps people? Because I guarantee you right now, I, I would love to ask this question, how many people are, you know, are in organizations where their DevOps people are getting targeted security training? You know, because if, again, if there's criminal groups that want to infiltrate them to be able to get into these massive um, orchestrated containerized environments, it's difficult to do so just with simply going in through APIs and client-side exploitation. It's just a lot easier to do in order to be able to package a Trojan course into these repos. Sorry I had to run through this, but um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to uh, you know, uh, follow me on Twitter uh, or email me at tonyuv at .com. But I appreciate the opportunity and thanks so much for your time.